Hi folks, this is Jay. Hope you're okay today. It's good to see you. And I just want to talk to you about inerrancy of scripture. I want to just present to you an argument from, say, an atheist or a skeptic, and then I just want us to unpack it and think about it. I've got an article that I'm going to read by Francis Schaeffer for a few minutes just to give us a bit of content to think about the subject. Uh, and this is just to get skeptics and Christians thinking. I'm not saying I have all the answers. I'm just using this as an opportunity to think through some really important issues. Excuse me. Now the argument from the skeptic would be something like this. Look, if, for example, the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of L Luke were edited, we know that possibly there's probably quite a bit of Matthew and, and Luke come from Mark, so there's been some kind of editing work there. If that's the case, then doesn't that blow to bits this idea of inerrancy? That all scripture is inspired of God, that is correct, and, and that has no faults uh, in it concerning scientific, moral, or literary uh, issues. And uh, that's a good, really, really good question. Now I'm going to read uh, The Great Evangelical Disaster by Francis A. Schaeffer, Chapter 2, A Watershed. He goes, not far from where we live in Switzerland is a high ridge of rock with a valley on both sides. One time I was there when there was no snow on the ground along that ridge. The snow was lying there and broken, a seeming unity. However, that unity was an illusion, for it lay along a great divide. It lay along a watershed. One portion of the snow when it melted would flow into one valley the snow which lay close beside would flow into another valley when it melted now it just so happened on that particular ridge that the melting snow which flows from one side of that ridge goes down into a valley into a small river and then down into a Rhine river the Rhine then flows on through Germany and the water ends up in the cold water of the North Sea the water from the snow that started out so close along that watershed on the other side of the ridge when the snow melts, drops off sharply down the ridge into the Rhone Valley. This water flows into Lake Lehman, or as it is known, the English-speaking world Lake Geneva, and then goes down below that into the Rhone River, which flows through France and into the warm water of the Mediterranean. The snow lies along the watershed, unbroken, a seeming unity, but when it melts where it ends in the destination, it l is literally a thousand miles apart. That is a watershed. That is what a watershed is. A watershed divides. A clear line can be drawn between what seems at first to be the same, or at least very close, but in reality ends in a very different situation. In a watershed there is a line. What does this illustration have to do with the evangelical world today? I would suggest that it is a very accurate description of what is happening. Evangelicals today are facing a watershed concerning the nature of biblical inspiration and authority. It is a water edge issue it, in very much the same sense as described in the illustration. Within the evangelicalism there are growing numbers who are modifying their views on the inerrancy of the Bible so that the full authority of scripture is completely undercut. But it is happening the very subtle ways, like the snow lying by side by side of the ridge, the new views of biblical authority often seem at first glance not to be so very far from what evangelicals until just recently have always believed. But also like the snow lying side by side on the ridge, the new view when followed consistently ends up a thousand miles apart. So then he goes on to say, Thus it's important to note that up until recent times belief in the inerrancy of scripture inerrancy of scripture, even when it was not practiced fully, claiming to be a Christian was were seen as two things which necessarily went together. If you were a Christian you also trusted in the complete reliability of God's written word, the Bible. If you did not believe the Bible, you did not claim to be a Christian. But no one until the past 200 years or so tried to say, I'm a Christian, but at the same time I believe the Bible to be full of errors, etc. So I'll, I'll put a link to Francis Schaeffer. That's a, that's a defining uh, text of the 20th century concerning Protestant evangelicalism, understanding of the inerrancy debate. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of inerrancy debates in America uh, in, from 1920s right up until... 
um, right up until the 1990s massive debates about whether scripture is inspired, fully inspired, whether it has faults in it or not. Massive, massive debates. One, one uh, famous situation is Wayne Grudem, uh, a systematic theologian, when he was a student at Fuller Theological Seminary, found that Fuller Theological Seminary didn't believe in the inerrancy of scripture and he was at war with the faculty there giving out pamphlets about the need to get back to inspiration of scripture etc. Where's all this going? Here it is. The atheist skeptic come along and says look Luke and Matthew Luke and Matthew um, must have edited their stuff. Now if they've edited it how does that square with inerrancy and verbal inspiration of, of the Bible? You look at the history of Protestant theology over the last 100 years from 1920 right up until um, the 1990s, a perfect document is in Francis Schaeffer. Inerrancy has been a key factor, key important doctrine. And the two uh, are at loggerheads the skeptic and then the orthodox evangelical view. So, what is my thinking? What is my opinion? Um, I think the problem, and you need to hear me out here, you need to hear me, I think the problem with Protestant doctrine of scripture, and I'm a Protestant, I'm a conservative evangelical, Francis Schaeffer is the kind of person that I would just love to be with, he's passed away, but that's where I'm at, That that I'm a Protestant evangelical, 100%, will die for the belief in the inerrancy of scripture. But well, here's the point. Um, Protestant evangelicals and skeptics and liberally, liberal Christians, liberal evangelicals, are all guilty of something. And that is imposing their understanding of inerrancy on the Bible. And not allowing the Bible to actually speak about what it's saying about itself. So all I'm saying is, I believe in the inerrancy of scripture, but as the scriptures define itself, and that many Protestant evangelicals and liberals and skeptics are defining what inerrancy is according to their 19th or 20th century or 21st century intellectual tools and imposing them upon the biblical text and then get themselves in all sorts of problems intellectually speaking from a skeptic and an orthodox christian position so for example um, an example is the gospels protestant theology has, has maintained that history is important which i believe i totally believe that one hundred percent skeptics have taken on board the nineteenth century understanding of history and chronology and facts of history are important etc so both Protestant and skeptical way of understanding history have these kind of intellectual tools that they've inherited from von Rank and and the whole 19th century understanding of, of history okay and they bring those intellectual tools to understand in the Gospels and then they find that the Gospels don't fit their intellectual tools so the Gospels must be wrong. Without actually bothering to ask the question, what are the nature of the Gospels? What is the nature of the Gospels? So let us look here, Luke chapter 1. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fully fi filled, fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things which you were instructed. So there, in this gospel, Luke is, is giving us an orderly account. Now the question is, what does he mean by orderly account? What does he mean? He's presenting us with some historical information, but he's also representing the Lord Jesus' teaching in various blocks. 
in various uh, thematic themes and if we don't get that then we're going to come a cropper if we come with our 19th century understanding of history let us look at the Gospel of John it says in the beginning verse 1 was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God all things were made through him and without him nothing was made now what history book on the life of a pope or the life of a king or the life of a president would say that so in other words this gospel the nature of this gospel the gospel of John is to be approached in its own context in its, on its own terms as it's presented itself in the literary genre that it's presented itself so the top and bottom of this is I believe in errancy I believe in the full inspiration of the Word of God I believe there are no faults in the Word of God whether it be historical or whatever and I believe every word of, the, of God is inspired in the original Greek and Hebrew okay I believe that but I want the Bible to speak for itself about how what is the nature of that inerrancy and I feel that Protestant theology of which I belong to can come along with a mechanical understanding of how to read the text using 19th century and 20th century intellectual tools and imposing them on the text and I believe also the skeptics come along and they do the same they use intellectual to tools about history for example from the 19th century and the 20th century and they impose it on the text and then they get themselves into intellectual problems my argument is this I believe in errancy but let the scriptures define what that means in the each individual context of the literary genre that you're studying uh, so I don't agree with the modern liberals, I don't agree with people like Biologos, I don't agree with these sophisticated intellectual biblical scholars, I don't agree with those who critique the Bible, I don't agree with the skeptics. What I believe is go back to the scriptures themselves and let the scriptures define what they are trying to say about themselves. In other words, the Reformation cry back to the sources.